Hey everyone, welcome back to our last house group of the year. Uh, we are kind of sad and uh, upset that this is our last um, house group, but next week we're gonna have a, a, the Christmas party. It's December 14th. It's gonna be a really fun time. Wear your best Christmas sweater, uh, your best buddy the elf outfit, uh, your Santa Claus outfit. It's gonna be a really fun time of fellowship and hangs and there'll be free food and cookies and Christmas team things to do. Um, so we'd love to see you guys next week at that cross conference. Hey, if you guys have not checked out or signed up for cross conference, we would love to have you guys there. Uh, it's gonna be over December 29th through January 1st. The price is $175. Um, if you guys need help financially to be able to go on this trip, please let us know and we will find some type of way to get you there. We don't want money to be the reason why you don't get to go on this. Um, so please let us know, send us a DM, send me an email, ask your group leader, uh, just talk to somebody. If you have any questions, come find me, uh, talk to your group leader. We'd love to talk to you about that. It's gonna be a really good time. There's only a few spots left. We would love to get those filled. We would love to get you on that trip. Um, if you are interested, you can sign up at highpointonline.com slash young adults or the Instagram bio. And that's all from me. So I look forward to seeing every one of you at the Christmas party next week. Um, we'll see you then. Good evening house. Hope everybody's doing great this evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Jordan. I'm one of the elders here at High Point. Uh, I've been going to High Point probably for nine years now, somewhere around nine years. Uh, we, um, um, I've counted as a privilege of being able to come to before you tonight and open up God's Word and work through 1 Peter chapter 5 with you. Parker asked me several weeks ago if I would do this, uh, specifically because it's addressing elders, uh, the first part, um, but I'm looking forward to breaking down the whole chapter. I know y'all been working through it the last month, and so um, I'm going to read um, the chapter, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into it. So let me pray, read God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 5. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising sight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God and not of sword gain, but with eagerness. Not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble." Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. Be sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him. Firm your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal uh, uh, called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a brotherly kiss, with a kiss of love, I'm sorry, and peace to you, all who are in Christ. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you, and we just thank you for this evening. I thank you for all these folks that are gathered in these small groups. I ask that um, you will take the, the words that I speak and Father, make sure that they conform to you. May they be your words, not mine. May they not be my thoughts, my, not my philosophies, but Father, your word, your truth. Father, I pray that you will use uh, the teaching tonight, Father, to com further conform us to your image, to make us like your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Encourage us, lead us. Father, we ask that you will just make us more like your Son. Father, again, thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. I thank you for this, this small groups. I thank you for uh, the house and the ministry there is. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. All right, let's jump into it. So the first verse 
starts off with a, uh, with a word, and I'm sure you all have heard this before. It says, therefore. And any time you see that the word therefore in Scripture, you need to look to see why it's there. You know, why is therefore therefore, you know? So we have to look back in chapter 4, and I know you all covered that a couple weeks ago. But in chapter 4, there's a couple things that Peter says as he's, he's um, starting in chapter, I um, mean, verse 12. He says, one, there is a fiery ordeal. He says um, in verse 12, 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. And then skip down to verse 17. He says, For it is a time of judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? The therefore is there to say, Guys, times of trouble are coming. Times of calamities are coming. Trials are going to, that, that will test your character. A time of judgment is coming. And it's going to begin first with the household of God. And so with that in line, light, Peter says, I exhort the elders among you. Now, the word exhort is the Greek word um, paraklia. Um, and it means I summon you. I entrust you to do something. I entrust you. I encourage you. I, I want you to, I want, I want the seriousness of the situation. I want to encourage you. And he says, you elders. Now the word elder is the word in the Greek uh, presbyterios. And it can mean several things. One, it can mean uh, the older of two people. It could mean a forefather. It could mean a, um, somebody who's advanced further in life. Um, it could also mean a rank in office. Um, the, the Gospels, they used over and over the term elder for people that were in the Sanhedrin, uh, they, um, for the Pharisees and the Sadducees that were leaders in the Sanhedrin. And that was used over and over again. Um, it's also used over and over again in the, the Word of God for leaders in the church. In Acts 14, 20 through 23, Paul and Barnabas, um, they appoint elders in the churches they were ministering to, in Lystra and Arcanium, I think that's how you say it, um, Antioch, and Titus 1, 15, Paul reminds Titus, the, one of the reasons why he left him in Crete was to appoint leaders in the church or elders in the church. So the word um, elders just means leaders. Um, the, uh, and leaders are important. Uh, Proverbs 29, 18 one of my favorite verses says, where there is no vision, the people perish, uh, or the people are unclothed, or the people are unrestrained. Where there is no God-given vision and mission cast before people, they flounder every time. And so there has to be leaders that will cast this vision, that will lead, that will lead in the mission and vision of God before the people of God. Um, so, Peter says, I exhort the elders among you. And then he says, as a fellow elder. So Peter's saying, hey, I'm also a leader. Um, leader in the church. And then he goes on to says, as a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So Peter was there. He was there at the crucifixion. He saw Christ die. He saw Christ, um, the resurrected Lord. And he said, a partaker also in the glory that is to be re revealed. This is a cool passage right here because he's referring back to when he was standing on the Mount of Transfigurations, uh, Transfiguration and saw our Lord Jesus Christ revealed as he truly is. Um, Peter reminds them, he saw him. Man, I saw what the Lord is, who he is, um, his, his glory, his majesty, everything he is. And he refers to that um, in the next book he writes, 2 Peter um, chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. And uh, he says, And I will also be diligent. And I will also be diligent at that time after my departure. You may be able to call these things to mind. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory, from God the Father, such as an utterance was made by uh, made to him by the majestic glory. 
This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And this had an impact in Peter's life. Man, huge impact. Seeing our Lord revealed as who he truly is. So Peter's saying, all right, I'm your fellow elder. I'm with you. Man, I've seen our Lord. I've seen the resurrected Lord. I've seen his glorified state. I know who he is. Um, and he says, man, I want to encourage you. I want to entrust you to do, do several things. One, shepherd the flock of God, he says. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Now, a shepherd, what is a shepherd's job? I mean, we've heard this a billion times, I'm sure, if you've been around the church. It is to lead a flock of sheep. And the church has been over, time, over and over again um, been referred to as sheep. So, and a sheep need a, need a shepherd. Sheep are prone to wander. Sheep are prone to parasites. Sheep are prone to disease. They're, um, they're prone to predators. Predators will get them. They have to be watched out for. They have to be protected. They have to be led. They have to be fed. They have to be even, um, there is, um, oh, let me back up. Let me, so I have a hobby farm and I have chickens and ducks and I'm looking at getting sheep this spring. And part of that, I went to Tractor Supply and I bought a book on all things sheep. Basically, it's like a 500 page book on just sheep. And so I'm reading all about sheep. And, and one of the things I found out about is sheep have to be inspected almost daily because a sheep will become sick and it will hide it. And you won't even know the sheep is sick until all suddenly one day you walk out and the sheep is dead. But when the shepherd personally inspects each sheep every day or on a regular basis, he gets familiar with the sheep and knows how the sheep acts and reacts and whether he's healthy or not. And that's the part of a flock, um, what a shepherd does. A shepherd leads and he, he protects and he's watching out for the, um, for the flock. And if there's no leadership, the people fall apart. Um, so... Peter's saying, man, you leaders, you elders, shepherd the flock of God. Um, and he says, don't do this under compulsion. This is, should be something you enjoy. This should be something you want to do. Um, the, um, you should find joy in it. He says, it, but with eagerness at the end of verse 2. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to will of God not for sword gain, but eat with eagerness. I enjoy being an elder. That's one of, one of the joys of my life is being an elder here at High Point. Uh, it's hard work. Um, I meet with a lot of people, I, uh, but I enjoy it. And uh, there's joy in it. As I see the health of our church, um, as we get healthier and healthier as a church body, it brings joy to me. And I love it. Um, I'm so thankful that God has allowed me to be in that position. So I serve with eagerness. And if one day God appoints you as an elder or leader in the church, you need to find joy in it um, and need to serve with eagerness. Um, if you don't, then you don't need to be in that position. Um, the, um, a couple other things about being a shepherd, um, as he says, goes on here. He says, not, verse 3, not lording yet, nor yet as lording over it, the, uh, over those allotted to your charge. As a shepherd, uh, well, I've been around cows. Let me back up. So my dad had a cattle farm. And if you had to get the cows all up, you had to do basically what was a cattle drive. You'd have to get a bunch of people out there and you'd have to get behind the cows and you'd have to kind of herd them to the direction you wanted them to go. And it was, they were being driven. But that's not how you lead sheep. Sheep, know the voice of the shepherd, and they follow the shepherd. Um, it's not, they're not being driven, but they're being led. There's a big difference in that. And that's what uh, Peter's saying here. He's saying, we're not to lord over the, the church, leaders aren't, but we're supposed to be led and to lead. We're supposed to be the first to lead, the first to serve, the first to give, the first to love. And if elders aren't doing that, they don't need to be elders. Um, the, um, my life goal 
should be to follow, listen, and serve my Lord Jesus Christ. Everything I am should strive to follow Christ. So I can say, so I should be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 4.16 says, I exhort you therefore, be imitators of me. Philippians 3.17, Paul says, follow my example. Observe the patterns you've seen. And that is, those are sobering verses for a leader. Uh, am I leading that way? Am I worthy to be followed? Do people see Jesus in me? Can people know what Jesus is like by following me? Man, those are... <laughs> that scares me. Um, it sobers me up. Because, um, frankly, I'm flawed. Uh, many times I feel like a, a fraud. I know my thoughts. I know my sin. I blow it. Just ask my family. I am not perfect. And I read these verses that say, man, I'm supposed to be leading and it, it scares me. Um, there's a lot of responsibility in it. Uh, go on to verse 4. He says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. My reward is from Christ. My reward is from God. But I will also be held accountable if I be, lead badly. There's accountability there. In Hebrews 13, 17 says that we will give an account to God for how we led the church. Man, God's going to hold me responsible, hold others' leaders responsible, hold our pastor, hold any person in leadership. He's going to hold accountable for how they led. Um, So let's continue. He goes on to say in verse 5, he says, You young men, likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves in humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So he says, young men, you youngsters out there, you whippersnappers, be subject to that leadership. God has placed elders over you. He's placed leaders over you. Follow them. And I know sometimes it's tough because just as I said, I'm flawed and I'm not perfect. So is every other leader at this church and every other leader at every church. They're flawed. They're not perfect. These leaders are men. They're women. They make mistakes. But if they're striving with everything they have to follow Christ and God has put them in that position, Peter says, be subject to their leadership. Follow them. And then he goes on and says, all of you clothe yourself in humility. Now, this humility he speaks of, and in the Greek it means a recognition of personal unworthiness before God. Not a false modesty, but rather an accurate self-perception. So in other words, you know who you really are. You're no heirs. You know, you know you're, you know you're flawed. Um, and it's not a self-rejection or it's not a bad self-image but a true understanding of who you are before God. So he's saying, clothe yourself in this humility toward one another. Understand, hey, you aren't perfect. I'm not perfect. I've heard this phrase before, and y'all might laugh at it. You realize you're, um, you are not all that in a bag of chips. Um, a lot of times pride gets in our, in our way. Pride is a problem. We act like we've got it all together, but we don't have it all, get, all together. We need to humble ourselves and acknowledge that and we have this personal unworthiness. We can't, without the blood of Christ on us, we cannot stand before God. It's all because of Jesus that we have this relationship. We have this joy. We have this peace. We have this salvation. You realize that you are not all that in a bag of chips. And he goes on and says, 
Uh, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God does not like pride. He's opposed to it. But those who really know they, who they are before God, he gives grace. Verse 6, humble yourselves. Now, the word humble there is a slightly different word than he uses before in verse 5, where verse 5, it talks about a personal unworthiness before God. You, you understand who that is. This word actually means a slightly different. It means you understand there's, you're assigned a lower rank uh, or place to be ranked below. And he goes on to says, humble yourselves. So think of yourselves as ranked lower, therefore under the mighty hand of God. We are not God. <laughs> he is. We understand we are not God and he is. He is all powerful and we are not. He is my ultimate authority in everything. We humble ourselves under him. We, we realize that he is the truth. He has got the call on my life. It says, cast all your anxiety upon him. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. You worried about the leadership of the church? You worried about um, school? You worried about life? He says, cast it all upon him. He cares for his church. He cares for his flock. He cares about you. Oh, real quick, I want to go back to the flock um, and elders. An elder also needs to realize he is just a hireling. That the chief shepherd, as he says in here in verse 4, is Jesus. He's the chief shepherd. And, man, I am just under his authority. Every elder has to realize that. It's not his flock. Um, high point is not my flock. High point is not Will's flock. High point is not the staff's flock. High point is God's flock. And uh, we are just temporary leaders here in this body. Um, meant to mention that a minute ago. So, um, then Peter calls the churches to be sober spirit. He says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. And we'll get to the rest of it here in a second, but sober spirit means to be calm and collected. To be on alert means to give strict attention, to be cautious, to take heed, lest some remission or some laziness, um, some destructive calamity suddenly overtake you. So we as believers... Got to be calm and collected. Um, in every situation, we are to be calm and collective and be cautious and be attentive, to be watching. Um, so how in this world, in the midst of chaotic chaos, and there's chaos going on around them, can a believer be calm and cautious? How can we cast every care upon Jesus? As he said in verse, verse 7. How is that done? Well, it's easier said than done. But I think if you go back to the Old Testament, the Psalms chapter 1, it gives us a recipe of how to do that. It gives us the answer. Psalm 1 verse 2, it says, Delight on the Word of God and meditate on it day and night. Only by meditating on God's Word can we become, what he says in verse 3, a tree um, planted by streams of water. John 15 says this, tells us almost the same thing, that we abide in Christ. We remain in Him. It is through the daily disciplines of prayer, meditation, and reading of God's Word, studying His Word, does this calmness, this collectedness, this cautiousness, this alertness, come into our lives. A close attention of going on, what's going on in our lives comes from this meditating on God's Word. The word meditating is, is like chewing on God's Word, thinking about it. Um, it. We delight in it because we spend time in it. The, um, um, the actually, you know, the, the, one of the contexts of, of the way it was used in Hebrew was, was like a lion 
with its prey there, with its food, like growling over it, like this is, I'm, I'm meditating on this and I'm not gonna let anybody get it. This is, I'm, I wanna chew on it for a while. So, if we're gonna be calm and collected, we're gonna be attentive, it starts with God's word. We have to be those daily disciplines of prayer and meditation. Um, so Peter goes on, it says, but be of sober spirit, be on alert. And then he says, your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring light on a lion, seeking someone to devour. So Peter has first experience, uh, firsthand experience with, with the devil. Um, if you go back to uh, Luke 22, verse 31 through 34, Jesus tells Peter that Satan has requested to sift him like wheat and that God has allowed it. Imagine that. And this isn't the first time in God's word that um, Satan has requested that. You go back to the book of Job. Job came, um, God, uh, Satan came before God and asked the same thing of Job. Satan is out there, and Peter knows that. And Peter um, failed. <laughs> he blew it big time. So Peter has experience in this. So when, as he's speaking to us, we need to remember that. Um, and he says, the devil, your adversary, is wanting to destroy you and devour you. The word devil is actually, the Greek word means false accuser, a slanderer. He says he's our adversary. He is, um, it's like an opponent in a lawsuit, the word the adversary is. He's our enemy. Peter's, not Peter, I'm sorry. The devil is wanting to destroy you. He's walking around, it says, prowling, walking, looking for opportunities. He's like a roaring lion. He's howling, he's howling, he's loud, and he wants to swallow you up and destroy you. Um, he wants to sift you like wheat, just like he did Peter, just like he did, he's done others. But if you look at Luke 22, Peter, pride was in his life. He told Jesus when Jesus said, hey, Satan's come and ask to sift you like wheat. He said, hey, I'm ready to go to prison, to death. His response was pride. Jesus was like, uh, no, dude, uh, you're going to blow it tonight. And um, then Peter did. I firmly believe um, that Satan does this on a regular basis with believers. He is accusing, lying about us before the Father. He's asking to test us. And the crazy thing is, God allows it, just as he did with Job and Peter. So out of Peter, Peter's experience, he writes the following things. He says, first of all, Respect him. Now, he doesn't, it doesn't say respect him, but he says he's your opponent. He's your adversary. He is dangerous. That's showing respect. So you've got to understand who your enemy is, that he wants to destroy you. You have to recognize him, he says next, that he's a liar because he calls him the adversary. He calls him um, the devil. Uh, he is a liar, a deceiver, a pretender. He wants to trap and devour you. He will take God's word and he will twist it. That's why you have to meditate on God's word. You have to know it. How did Christ respond to um, Satan when he came and tempted him in the... Um, he responded to him with the word of God. You've got to know the word of God. And then he says, resist him. Verse 9, take your stand on God's word just as Jesus did. Resist him. Firm in your faith. Stand firm in your faith. Understand what Jesus has done for you. Understand the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. Understand that, that God, um, through his word, will bring you through that temptation. But if we let pride stand in the way, or we let our pride there, we're going to crumble every time. 
Um, the, um, he goes, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So he goes on to say, hey, of course, the book of Peter, 1 Peter, is written to the scattered churches in Asia Minor. I'm sure you all talk, talked about this. And all these churches are scattered out through there, and Peter's writing this book, and it's going to be circulated around through these different churches. And he's saying, hey, guys, remember, you're suffering. You're going through trials. Satan's attacking you. He's looking to devour you. That's the same thing that's happened to other, um, other believers, other brethren in the world. They're experiencing the same thing. And so a lot of times we get caught in our little bubble and we're thinking about, you know, oh, woe is me. Oh, man, this is happening all over. He is, Satan is trying to destroy God's church. Um, we tend to think of our own little bubble, like I said. We tend to think we're the center of the world, but God is active throughout the world. A couple things, um, the fastest growing churches in the world are in Asia, are in the Middle East. Um, South Korea is one of the largest um, mission, missionary sending countries in the world. They rival the United States. South Korea. And back in the 1950s, there weren't that many believers there. God has done a work in South Korea, and now they're going. There's work being done all around the world, and we just get focused here on our little bubble, our little area. But believers in the Middle East are suffering. Believers in China are suffering. And a lot of times we just get worried about what our friends are doing on Friday night, or why we're not invited, or our little, you know, my work, or... Man, there's big things going on in the world. We need to remember that. Peter says, hey, don't forget that. He says, verse 10, After you've suffered for a little while, the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So he says, after you've suffered a while, um, God who invited you, so that word called there, this actually means invited you. He invited you into his eternal glory which is, a, we could explore that for a while, uh, will do the following thing in your life. One, he will perfect you. In other words, he's going to complete. He will mend you. And the, the Greek word actually means what, what has been broken. He's going to mend what has been broken to equip and strength, strengthen to make what ought to be. What we ought to be, God is going to take and he's going to mend us. He's going he's to strengthen us. He's going to complete us. Then he says, he's going to confirm us. He's going to make us stable. He's going to fix us. He's going to make us firm. He's going to render us constant. He's going to confirm in our mind, in one's mind. He's going to confirm these things. Then he's going to say, then he says, I'm going to strengthen you. Our Lord is going to strengthen you. He's going to perfect you. He's going to confirm you. He's going to strengthen you to make you strong. Not physical strength. This refers to one's soul. He is going to strengthen you. Then he says, establish you. That's to lay a foundation, to make you stable. Now, what's the purpose of a foundation? To be built upon. So your life, as he perfects you, confirms you, strengthens you, establishes you, he wants to build upon you. And that means other people. It means your life is supposed to be a foundation for others. Going back to what we talked about, being a leader, um, that we're to be an example, that our life is supposed to be following Christ, and we're to look behind us and say, follow me as I follow Christ. Be an um, imitate me as I Im imitate Christ. And so when we have this, we've been established and have this firm foundation, we can say that. Follow me as I follow Christ. Because it's his foundation that he laid upon our lives, not my foundation. He goes on to say, as we wrap up, to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Man, that's like, and to him, and him is major emphasis. It screams off the page. It says to him, to Jesus, 
to be dominion forever and ever. Man, may he reign forever. Through Sylvanus, that's, um, he's basically writing the letter through, this, um, through his disciple. For so I regard him, our faithful brother, for I, so I regard him. I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Stand firm in the faith. And I love the picture of standing firm in the faith. It's, it's almost like, you, like some, there's an onslaught coming before you. And you plant both your feet. And you're like, all right, I'm standing firm. I got my feet planted. Man, when it hits me, I'm, I'm there. It's almost like I remember playing football in high school. And they used to say, man, you got to break down. Man, guys coming toward you. You don't let them juke to the right, to the left. Man, you break down and then you let them go. And then you, then you make your move. I mean, you're standing firm. Um, stand firm in it. Stand firm in the Word of God. Stand firm in the grace of God. Um, she who is Babylon, um, she who is in Babylon, and that's, um, scholars believe that is refer uh, reference to Rome, uh, chosen together with you, uh, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. So the guy who wrote the book of Mark, the guy also who deserted uh, Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey, Mark is there with Peter. And many believe that Peter discipled Mark and poured into him. And then he wrote the book of Mark. Um, he says, Greet one another with a kiss of love, and peace be to all who are in Christ. So to sum up this, this chapter, one, Peter says, Man, I am encouraging leaders to be shepherds. Shepherd the flock of God. Too. He says, be an example. May your life be such that others can follow and see Christ in your life. He says, humble yourself. Man, understand who you are, that we are not worthy, and that He is our Lord and He's our Savior. Understand that we are supposed to put ourselves under His authority. Then watch out. Be an alert. Because Satan, the devil, wants to destroy us. He's looking for opportunities in your life and in my life to bring us down. And then he says, remember. Remember what God is going to do in your life. Remember what he has promised. He says he's going to perfect you. He's going to confirm you. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to establish you. He's going to do these things. I'm not going to do them. God's going to do them. So just want to encourage you this evening. Um, as we wrap up, um, if you desire to be a leader, it's a good thing. Um, and um, to understand what a shepherd is, that your life needs to be an example. And um, I'm done. So uh, let me pray for us, and we will. Um, I'll see you guys later. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for um, uh, your servant Peter uh, writing this letter uh, to the uh, scattered churches. I pray that uh, you will take um, this word as it was taught tonight and that you will strike anything that is not of you um, from their ears and that you will help them remember anything that is of you. Um, Father, I pray that, um, that um, you will be glorified. I pray that um, your people will serve you and follow you, that we will be humble and Father, I pray we will allow you to do the things that you want to do in our lives, that to perfect us, to confirm us, to strengthen us, and to establish us. Uh, Father, you do have all dominion forever and ever, and we acknowledge that, and we love you, and we look forward to, to your coming. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.